Thanks for the invitation and thanks to the uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, IPS team to have trusted and kind of uh, given me the opportunity to discuss interesting thing on this Teachers' Day. I thank uh, one and all uh, the teachers who have actually helped me to kind of learn the topic much, much better. Now, uh, we have how much time, sir? Because I know we are running out of time. If you can tell me... Uh, 40, the minutes. Time 40 minutes. Okay, I'll try to keep it uh, lesser than that. Yes. Okay. So, we are going to talk on psychopathology in the digital era. Uh, when we are talking about psychopathology in digital era, the first thing I would like to bring up here is uh, my parents told me that every story has a moral and you need to pick up the moral of each of these stories to make your life much better. In the same way, a uh, lot of experience which we kind of come across when we deal with our patients are the best teachers for us many times. A lot of things we don't read and learn, but when we actually see them in our patients, we kind of understand it. Why I'm highlighting this is because I will give a lot of case scenarios which we'll discuss uh, in the future slides and understand the learning from it. The characters used in this lecture are purely fictional. Any resemblance with people who are living or dead are purely coincidental. Now, I'm sure your day starts with some statements like this. Like, of course, they'll complain a lot of things, and they will also say, Miti Miriga, mobile use chestaru or Vinyogam chestaru, and a lot of these things. Once you see the first client, the second client would come with similar history. The family members would complain, or the patient themselves would complain. At the end of the day, when you have done with 5, 10, 15, or 20 patients, depending on the number of patients you end up seeing, I'm sure a major chunk of patients would have issues related to excessive use of mobile or something on the mobile and those things. So are all of these people the same? See, even though their primary complaint is excessive using of gadget or mobile, are all of these people same or each one of them different? This is what we need to look at, right? And again, a lot of us, are yesteryear psychiatrists who possibly did not see so much of technology usage earlier in our patients. So should we revisit and ask different kind of questions? That is what we are going to talk about here. I'm sure each one of us here sitting will agree that things are changing. Things are definitely changing and there's no doubt about it. Now, since things are changing, let me highlight an interesting point here. We might struggle to get ambulance within 30 minutes in today's situation, especially with the COVID pandemic, you know, sometimes you don't get an ambulance at all. We might still struggle to reach clean water to some of the parts of the cities, forget about villages, even some cities don't get uh, clean water at need. But we all will agree within 30 minutes, we can definitely get pizzas, sometimes your cabs, and many other things within 30 minutes can get delivered. So technology has helped in many, many ways, but there are still a lot of challenges where we are still struggling with. So we all agree that technology is part and parcel of life. Whether we like it or not, it is in and around us and we cannot escape that. This is where we need to introduce something called as the internet is called as triple A engine. What is internet called as? It is called as the triple A engine. It is affordable. It is accessible and it also gives you a lot of anonymity. You can, you can virtually create an anonymous character and live with it. Now, this is what triple A engine and power of internet is. With these three A's. Now, when you're talking about psychopathology, we do understand psychopathology is the crucial point of understanding by any psychiatrist, right? It gives meaning to the sufferings of these people who are having very different kind of experiences. It gives meaning to their sufferings. So psychopathology at any point of time cannot be dismissed. It aids not just in that, in understanding, it aids in communication to the patient, to fellow colleagues. It helps in diagnosis and standardization. So for all of us to talk the same language, we need psychopathology as the backbone. So in the background of technology becoming so overwhelming and changing, and psychopathology being the crucial aspect of mental health care system, does it need to change is what we need to look at. So what are we talking about here? 
what we are talking about here is we need to understand that when you're talking about psychopathology in particular, we could be talking about two things. One, psychopathology could be changing. Something which is already existing could be changing or some new psychopathology could be coming in, which we are not aware of. And it is coming in because of the adventure of this technology and gadgets and digital use and social media and so many things. So existing things can change, the new things can change, or there can be a combination of it, which could also be happening, which could change. So what is important here for us to understand is when you're looking at psychopathology and digital interface, you can look at three levels. One is it can initiate some problems. It can also progress over a period of time. And there could be things which can maintain this whole psychopathology. To keep it very simple, we can understand the psychopathology and internet as two components. One is internet exclusive psychopathology, internet facilitated psychopathology, internet exclusive psychopathology, and internet facilitated psychopathology. So in internet exclusive psychopathology, if internet was not there, this psychopathology would have not happened. Because internet is there, the psychopathology is happening. Whereas in facilitated, we are talking about those where the internet is just facilitating the whole psychopathology process. So which are those conditions where internet is the crucial backbone of the whole psychopathology or internet exclusive? Social media. If so, if internet and World Wide Web and uh, all these mobile phones and those connecting devices are not there, social media is not discussed at all. So you need internet as the pillar of this psychopathology. MMORPG, what is this MMORPG? These are these massively role play games which are available, all your PUBGs and other games which are there, right? A lot, a lot of people who get addicted. So this massive online role play games are ones which need internet. Without internet, you cannot get into that kind of a system. So they are internet exclusive psychopathology we are talking about. Of course, we are also talking about internet facilitated psychopathology. The kind of psychopathology we are talking about here could be an extension of the existing problem. There are problems which are already existing and it is an extension. For example, I have some addiction issues offline, that addiction issues goes online. I have some problems offline, that same problem goes online. That is an extension of it. Or it can also be a modification. Modification means I have anxiety in routine world. So what I end up doing is because I'm anxious in the routine world, I don't meet, meet people in the routine world. So I modify my anxiety. I go up and spend a lot of time on the internet. So these are the kind of modifications which can happen. Now, we all understand one simple fact that every internet user is unique. We cannot say all 10 users of internet are the same. I might use internet in a different way. You might use internet in a different way. X, Y, Z people might use internet in a different way. What is important for us to look at when we're evaluating a person with digital use and technology issues and those things is how much of it is excessive use? How much of it is maladaptive use? We need to kind of look at it because we can't ask them not to use technology because today with all the pandemic, every kid has to be on online class. You can't take away technology, we, we have to give them. But is there an excessive use component? Is there a maladaptive use component? That history will help us to help these clients much better. Also, not just asking excessive use or maladaptive use, we should also look for generalized factors and specific factors. Are they using mobile phone on longer duration? What particular platforms do they use? Specific questions on why do they use a particular thing for longer duration? Why do they play a particular game for longer duration? Or why are they using chat or any mode for longer duration? These are things which are specifically looked at. So that questions will help us to kind of evaluate and understand psychopathology much, much better. So we all understand as psychiatrists that mental health is driven by data. Mental health is driven by data and data and data. The more data we have, the more history we have from the family members, from the patient, from the other caregivers, we actually can make better diagnosis. So data being the core of mental health issues, you need to understand technology today ends up giving you lots of data, not just a lot of data. It also can give you a lot of live data. You can, you can get a lot of live data, which is actually happening 
uh, in today's world. So with these kind of understandings, let me give you some basic examples and try to kind of bring in some conversations. Hopefully, once I finish, we'll have some questions and we can discuss some interesting aspects. So let me highlight to you some interesting aspects of interviewing and possibly asking some interesting questions to kind of understand things much better. I'm giving you an example of uh, this young uh, uh, adult who I was seeing and the parents kept saying they found a very odd behavior in him. The odd behavior was he had put bindi of his mother. His mother used to use this bindi and he had put his bindi's, I mean, bindi of his mother on the webcam of the laptop. He was using a laptop and he had covered that webcam with the bindi. They said, we don't understand why was he doing that. And uh, along with all the concerns they had and they brought him in, this was something which was unusual, which was reported to us. Now, which textbook will teach us why would somebody use bindi on a uh, webcam? Now, until unless we ask these kind of questions, we don't get to see these people. But I'm sure a lot of them do some weird things like this. Now, when we evaluated further, when we spoke to him further, we got to understand a lot of things. How technology is used by people. Now, in simple ways, there are two kinds of users. One are people who substitute. See, for example, uh, I find something uncomfortable in real world, so I substitute it to the digital world. Another kind of people are leading normal lives in real world. They also add on to the digital world. So there are two kinds of users in simple ways. One are the substitutors where they substitute the real world to digital world. Another are the add-on people where they are leading real world in normal ways, but they add on a lot of digital things for their add-on purposes. Why should you know this in this purpose? Question on online behavior, why they prefer something, why they uh, give, what reason do they give? The pros and cons of their interaction would be helpful. In this particular scenario, what I mentioned to you, it's interesting for us to know that on further evaluating this guy, asking him why was he putting up this bindi on the webcam, we realized he was actually extremely socially anxious person. He preferred never to get on video in any interaction, whether it is college interaction or whether it is he was doing a part-time job on meetings, he was not wanting to get by chance also on video. So he knew sometimes the video can get on because unknowingly he might press the button or the settings would have changed. So to ensure that never he would get on video, he had put up a bindi on it. Now, what was happening in this guy was we were seeing long-standing history of social anxiety, which was never addressed. And we all know social anxiety is such a common problem, which happens in people. With social anxiety being such a common problem, what happened in him was he was using digital world a lot more. The primary reason they brought him was because he was always online and would not go out and meet his friends and those things. And he would be online spending a lot of time and the reason he would do it is because for him, the routine world was so anxious. So he substituted it with the digital world. And in, in digital world, he could create his own locus of control. By putting up a bindi, he need not be on video on, with anybody else. So this happened for months and years together is what you need to understand. So when you're dealing with the social anxiety, along with the medications or other things we worked upon, we spoke to him about pros and cons and why did he prefer this kind of a mode, which gave us a better understanding of a psychopathology that helped us talk to the psychologist and devise interesting CBT processes where slowly at one point of time, we could ask him to remove his bindi on the... Uh, webcam and kind of work on it. So what I'm trying to give you here as an example is asking questions on online behavior, why they prefer that, what is the reason behind their preference, the pros and cons of those kind of interactions would help us as clinicians to work with psychopathology, understand psychopathology and help psycho psychopathology much, much better. Another interesting scenario I can give you an example is there is this guy who I was consulting for depression and uh, 
his unfortunately he had a resistant depression with multiple dip- medications he would partially respond and those things over years we saw he developed an interesting strategy for himself we always keep saying right as as a clinician we say see your depression is quite resistant you need to understand you need to accept it and start living with it look for small goals and those things now we do say them to look for small goals small meaningful tasks and those things now this is where i'm putting across something like he at one point of time came and told me something interesting like i wonder uh, i i order on ali express now unfortunately with uh, all the covid pandemic happening ali express uh, is not more available uh, and the prices have increased so much and you can't easily ship it from china these days but this was just before the pandemic we are talking about this guy used to order only on ali express now i was quite curious about why is he ordering only on ali express not on other things which are available in india where the costs see i thought initially it is just the cost later on i realized when i spoke to him to understand his psychopathology in detail when i had more conversations with his uh, uh, ali express experience i got to know a lot more things first of all i have a question here is history of shopping important in our clients should we ask them do they shop more online offline what kind of shopping do they do i'm sure as good clinicians we know history of shopping is important uh, because it does give you a parameter of mood we know in patients with mania sometimes they can end into excessive shopping it can be online offline and all kinds of things uh, we also know it can be a predictor of regulatory system impulse control and those things it can help us so it's important for clinicians to ask these kind of kind of questions not just because of technology coming in otherwise also shopping can be an addiction we understand it can happen even in offline where people can go and spray spring of shopping buy a lot of things where many of the things are not necessary and they might burn up their pockets but with online adventure it is even more higher is what we need to understand why should we kind of know these things is because coming to this ali express person why did he shop so much more in ali express interestingly speaking when i spoke to him i understood he would order in ali express some 50 rupees item or a 70 rupees item some odd pencil or a odd eraser he would order and ali express if you really see first of all cost would be very less they would ship you even that one eraser two erasers would come to you and it would take easily anywhere between 4 weeks to 8 weeks to sometimes even 12 weeks for that to ship and come from china it comes in free service it will come sometimes it might end up not reaching also because many times in customs and those it gets lost because these are small items which are coming it gets lost so if the from the time of order to the time of getting it would take easily 6 weeks to even 12 weeks sometimes so we keep telling people with the resistant depression work for small purposeful goals and those things so what he did was he wanted to have some purpose some goal so we would order of some items which is just 250 rupees or 300 rupees and keep on checking every day every second day every third day where is it reached is it being tracked as it reached india is it in customs when is it coming and those things so he kind of developed his own purpose and meaning fortunately in him he was not abusing it to the extent that he was not ordering 10000 15000 and burning his pockets at the same time he had developed his own structure every third day he would go to that site and see what is the tracking and come out but it would give him some small purpose should i stop him is the question because it would give some meaning to him and it was not addictive it was not maladaptive so sometimes we need to understand these kind of psychopathologies when we talk to them they discuss otherwise they would not share these things to us because they think psychiatrists are not interested in these things but it gives you a good clue on their mental health aspects it gives you a good clue whether they are adaptive maladaptive should we intervene should we not intervene should we keep a watch and those things that's an example which i wanted to share i will share you another interesting example this guy who had been seeing him for a long time used to have recurrent depression where uh, many months he would do fine ag- again have acute depressive episode we would tweak the medication he would get better he was a homosexual um in orientation and uh, this guy came in and met me and he said i'm using grinder always the moment he said i'm using grinder always the only one grinder which came to my head was this grinder which you're seeing on the screen i did not do any, i did not know any other grinder as a, 
but i knew when he was telling i'm using grinder always something is there so i asked him um what grinder are you talking about and what do you mean by i'm using it always now that is when he showed an app on his phone which is grinder okay g r i n d r it's a one of the best social networking or one of the very famous social networking sites you might wonder i know social networking site like facebook and those who, how come grinder is something i don't know this is specifically been developed for the lgbtq kind of community and not necessary that we should not be there but it is specifically developed by and used by the lgbtq kind of community community now the moment he said that i was curious i wanted to ask some see this is where uh, when the organizers asked why should we have this kind of a talk i said see we need to clean as clinicians revisit and ask some different kind of questions to our clients so i asked him okay you said you are using excessively what do you mean by it why do you use and those that's when i get to understand this grinder app is when you put on a location for example i'm sitting here if i put a location on next in it will say in next 200 meters or so are there any other homosexuals who are registered on this grinder social networking app whether you can connect with them or not so when the moment you puts on a location you can look for potential partners and those things now you understand in a country where it is very difficult to talk about homosexuality and those things right just like that and sometimes there is always legal harassment and so many other things the only options they have is these kind of medias now imagine is looking for potential partners and those things and putting his location on what can happen constantly you need to understand this is enough reason for him to have unwarranted expectations and constantly keep on checking and checking and that is how we got into the trap of grinder use almost at excessive gadget use at one point of time he used to spend 8 hours to 9 hours on grinder putting the location on going to different places searching for various people and trying to meet them and those things can you imagine the amount of time he was losing because he was on this app and constantly wanting to figure out and this app is constantly picking up data and giving them so it puts you into a vicious cycle of addictive behaviors and those things why should we know this is because once we know that we can kind of intervene and say what else can be done say i i can easily tell them don't use this app now if i say i don't use this app he's not going to stop it because it is not like he doesn't want to use the app does he have an alternative does he have an alternative of way of figuring out homosexual friends homosexual partners until unless we don't help him on that just asking him not to use that will not help and we realized the location on and potential partners being shown is the feature of the app it can help some people but in him it was causing addictive behavior so that's where our psychopathology exploration requires us to question why do they use how do they use what's the pros what's the cons how much time these kind of interviewing skills comes in only when we are willing to listen to their stories and kind of understand so this is one of the other experiences i wanted to share now uh, the moment i show this slide don't worry the uh, network is not kind of uh, gone off the zoom is still working we are all still uh, digitally very much fine i'm sure this is a screen we see when internet goes off and we are on chrome browser right it happens when internet goes off some of us don't know that dinosaur in that corner is a game if you click a space bar the dinosaur will start running and you can play a game till internet comes uh, i have seen one person who was actually addicted to this particular game he would wantedly put off the game uh, he would wantedly put off the internet and keep on playing this game hours together it's a very simple game but can become addictive in some people why have i put this slide is because one of my uh, patients was a young about 16 17 year old boy he was brought by the mother in a very panic mode and she said i want to see you today because i think there is a serious issue we are dealing with and the serious issue was they saw this guy was using excessive uh, phone and uh, internet and uh, they said no internet from today they just cut the cable and they said no internet this guy said i'm going to kill myself you're not going to give internet and the moment he said that they went bonkers because they felt i mean how can somebody kill themselves just because internet is not there now this guy was brought in with threatening to kill himself and hurt himself and they felt very very worried so this is where is history of gaming important so i am sure as clinicians we all agree gaming is an important history we should look for 
we will agree to look at what game why game how much game pros and cons of game and what makes them play this game for such a long time the maintenance factors these are exclusive things we need to look at in this particular guy i can give you an example is uh, when we spoke to him i asked him uh, see the parents brought you here not just because you are gaming they thought your reaction to not having internet at home looks too much they thought wanting to die because you have no internet looks too much for them and they couldn't tolerate it that's why they have brought you in when i spoke to them i learned a lot of interesting things from this adolescent guy i learned that he spends a lot of time playing games and parallelly we noticed that he was an academically good chap nowadays his academic things had reduced now his explanation was very simple he said i am not looking for big careers i am not looking at iits medical schools and those things i want to be a carefree freelancer doing some digital art and digital work i like art work i want to do some digital art do some designing here and there earn some money and live life in a peaceful way i want money but not to significant extent so i don't want to get into the competitive world second explanation he also interestingly uh, mentioned was he said uh, i do excessive gaming because i don't like the game i like the friends with whom i can connect on the game i i i spoke about massive online role play games right those games give you an advantage of socially networking with other people so he had developed some 5 10 friends out there and he used to connect with those friends instead many times he would be playing less but hours together chatting with them generally about movies politics friends and different things so i noticed that it was not just gaming it was being used like a social media connect also and moreover we also identified that he had significant social anxiety which would make him not to have too many friends and have discussion now why i'm suggesting these things is because until we ask him interesting stories we actually would never get to know why he would maintain i'll tell you a very interesting point which could help us a lot of young people and parents together a lot of kids will say my parents don't want to sit and talk to me the kids uh, and the parents will say uh, the kids don't want to sit and talk to me so both say they don't want to sit and talk that's when we realize in this example this guy was actually one of the top 5 national level champions in that particular online game he was play, playing he was one of the best in our country in that online i was rated high he was paid money to play games and all those things but his parents would never acknowledge him winning he would say okay this is okay what about the exams uh, they they always would constantly keep on telling it's important for you to get into exams you getting good marks and those things they would dismiss his online success now that would annoy him and never make him talk about his success in online games next important thing what was noticed is the parents would for him 8 9 hours of gaming means he has to talk about gaming to somebody but if the parents say i don't want you to talk about gaming automatically he has nothing to talk to them so this is where we need to as mental health professionals work with the parents and work with the kid and get them to reach a common level where they kind of share experiences even though see i might not want my kid to play so much of gaming but if the kid wants to share something about the gaming can we even listen to it for 2 3 minutes it can be even given a listening ear for some time to get them to understand the maladaptiveness is what we need to look at to do that it requires both the ends meet that is where good clinicians understanding the psychopathology can help these scenarios better we simply think gaming is all about entertainment if it goes more it is addiction not necessarily to there are a lot of gray areas between that people can game excessively because they have an identity there sometimes they game because it's a career for them sometimes they gear game more because they have communication out there sometimes they game there because it's a good distraction for them in the real world kind of scenario so that's something which we should know i'll give you a very another interesting example to understand how the complex psychopathologies can unfold so the example which i can give you here is this guy who came and told me i watch porn in my car i watch porn in my car and this is the primary problem with which he came and met us now automatically as clinicians we know it is important to check for history of pornography and all sexual addictions and other things we do agree but 
you, let me highlight some interesting points which I learned from this person. This guy was doing an executive MBA, uh, extremely rich, capable person was doing an Harvard executive MBA, uh, even though he is CEO of a big company. Now, what happened was uh, at, at one point of time, his adolescent son and daughter got into a lot of issues at school and relationships and substance use and those, there was a lot of chaos at home, mental health problems of both the adolescent son and daughter. So with so much issues happening, everybody was concentrating on these issues. And obviously uh, the sexual life takes a back seat, right? Uh, the husband and wife the sexual life takes a back seat. And um, now what happened in this guy was slowly we noticed things changed and he started spending a lot of time traveling in, tra in Bangalore, we know uh, traffic jams and traffic is the space you spend a lot of time. You don't work a lot of time, you spend a lot of time in traffic jams. So he ended up watching a lot of pornography in his back seat when he's sitting in the car. Now, how did we help him? To help him, first of all, when we had detailed history, we realized he was not wanting to get into pornographic addiction. Somewhere, because of all the things which are happening, the issues at home, the uh, backseat of sexual life and the kind of stress he was going through, he started off pornography, the two watching in the car, basically because to distract himself and kind of feel a sense of control and those things. Now, we all know technology, the moment you start has a tendency to addict you. So unfortunately, he started using more and more, more and more, more and more. Now, other than a lot of things, we helped him, we gave him fluoxetin, we gave a lot of other strategies and those things to help him. But one of the interesting things which helped him is because there are two things which helped him significantly. One was as he was doing executive MBA, earlier when he was coming in car for long durations, he used to listen to online videos and listen and read, make notes and make his progress on the executive MBA, which had completely stopped because of the stress, it had got converted into watching pornography. Second thing was, when he was watching this pornography, automatically, obviously, he's using some wireless speakers and headphones and those things. So he's personally listening to him at the backseat of the car and the driver is driving it across. So we kind of developed two behavioral strategies. We asked him, can he, can he not use mobile phone as much as he can in the car and use a physical book to read uh, for his executive MBA and get back to complete his executive MBA. We tried to push him to do it as much as he can and we developed some contingency steps. It helped a lot. Second thing we interestingly did was we said, can you do one thing? Can you keep your phone not on Bluetooth speakers, but actually kind of volume on and travel. Now what happens is obviously it is very embarrassing for somebody to sit back and listen to or watch pornography videos with volume on and those things. So that constantly put a constraint in him, not able to do it. Now, again, it is he who has to do it, but it is we who have to help him to kind of develop these kind of skills. Now, this is where understanding psychopathology is the best way to help people. It is easy for us to say, okay, we have to see the God in the other person to treat him. For us to even see that, we need to be magnanimous to understand the psychopathology and understand what could be their experience to help them out. That is where it's good to learn a lot from these people and work upon. There was this person who said, uh, very young person, I possibly will give this example, then wind up uh, and take some questions if there is uh, there. This is an interesting adolescent young girl who came to meet me. Um, the person said, I went online because I wanted to take some help. I knew my parents cannot help me. Like any other adolescent believes, they said, I went online to take some help. I went to, into a particular portal. I shared problem one, problem two, problem three. Can you help me? Some people helped. They gave some suggestions. Do this, do that, do this, do that. It helped me. But there was one comment which uh, somebody said was, your, your life looks like a documentary. Uh, 13 reasons why on Netflix. Now, this one person who commented, your life is like the documentary 13 reasons why um, on Netflix, Netflix was enough comment because what happened was this, this young girl was very keen in figuring out what was the 13 reasons why. Uh, 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 the, uh, that 13 reasons why is a documentary which talks about it is a third it's a documentary which talks about 13 reasons why a young adolescent or a young adult 
killed herself the first sip now she gives the example of bullying she gives example of harassment uh, sexual abuse and all those kind of reasons uh, why people cheated why people did this why people did that and ended her life now this young girl who first of all listened to the comment went ahead to see the 13 reasons why actually end up attempting to end life and that is when she was brought to us now why i am such a uh, uh, talking about these things is because we need to understand there are a lot of things which goes wrong in vulnerable population in vulnerable population it is important for us to understand they come to us with the last thread uh, there are a lot of pro suicide uh, pro suicide content which can be not necessary a website somebody can trigger as simple as yeah your life is messed up i don't think there is any reason you should be living is enough for that to take the next step we know of further effect which can happen we know of copycat suicides which can happen as mental health professionals talking to them asking them okay why did you think of trying to hurt yourself uh, i know you did this but why did you think of how did you get this idea did you see someone did you hear from somewhere these are small areas through which we can actually help not just that individual a uh, larger community at large so we know without whatsapp today we cannot survive it's oxygen for us so uh, we know whatsapp gives you that online whether you are online or not it gives you that blue, blue tick it also says the status these are all challenges we know these are all uh, prescription for addiction we have to ask ourselves can we ask a lot of mental health uh, young post graduates to do studies on these areas because can it be a breeding ground for mental health issues we know day in and day out lot of our patients come and talk about these things and sometimes we dismiss it or we say yeah it will be there uh, don't use whatsapp no don't use whatsapp is not the solution for somebody who needs whatsapp i think when we talk to them asking them why why not how pros cons what makes them maintain will help us to help them much much better so these are things which we need to be looking at uh, as as professionals it's also important for us to know transference and counter transference issues can always happen if, even when you're exchanging messages and other challenges there can be things which can be going wrong uh, due to kind of lack of time this can be a separate uh, uh, discussion we can always have we can talk about it at some point of time separately um, so before we wind up one of the important things i would like to kind of uh, say is uh, there's this guy uh, who is sitting at home idle and uh, mother says okay you are not fit for anything you're not doing any work do one thing that this pond near your near the house right there are lot of big fishes out there go catch up some fishes and come uh, we will uh, will will we'll make at least meal at least you'll be useful for that and the mother sends this young guy he goes to the pond and she sits there and catches a lot of fishes he catches he catches a lot of fishes and ultimately he throws all these fishes ultimately and he comes back home empty handed mother is extremely furious and angry saying how come you cannot get even one single fish from that pond because you just put your hand there you can catch a fish out there that's when the young guy said no mom i actually caught a lot of fish but all those i remember the frying pan we have is only 6 uh, inches but all these fishes were so big i was wondering how can you actually fry this fish in this such small pan so i dismissed all of them and i threw back and came back what he did not realize was he one is we can always increase the size of the pan or we can always cut the fish and sort out the issues so this is where we need to understand as we evolve as clinicians we have to evolve with the digital psychopathologies the way the psychopathology evolves and those fish remains still the bible for psychopathology but fish has to be adapted to the current digital technology and those things if we don't do it it might be challenging and we might always lead into trouble so it's always good to understand let's not dismiss let's not get drowned into too much of technology i think it's learn it's good to learn to surf and it's good to drive rather than get driven by all this technology and things around us i think i have highlighted a lot of crucial interesting points for us to have discussion i would be happy to take any questions uh, which are asked thank you